On this week's episode of Local Matters, we go to Camp Nikon in Kingston to talk conservation and bird watching, talk with Americana Theatre founder Derek Martin, learn about college for seniors on the local scene, and highlight what's good and good to know in our South Shore towns. I'm Elizabeth Shanahan Jewett. Let's get started. Wooded roads and pathways and a small beach at Smelt Pond made Camp Nikon in Kingston the perfect spot to go on the local scene to learn about land conservation and watching and identifying native birds. I'm Matt Pinella, conservation agent for the town of Kingston. I'm Mike Perrin, I'm the assistant conservation agent for the town of Kingston. And we're here today at Camp Nikon and this is a great conservation area in the south of Kingston. It's about 250 acres running between Rabbit Road and Monks Hill Road. So today we'll be uh, taking a walk around Camp Nikon, uh, pointing out some really great um, parts of the ecosystem here. Uh, it consists of a lot of uh, coastal plains uh, pine barrens, which is a globally rare ecosystem, uh, and some birds that go along with that ecosystem. Uh, so we'll see a good mix of migrants, uh, which are birds that are coming up from the south. Uh, they came, a lot of them came about uh, two weeks ago, and you're either just passing through the area or setting up shop, uh, establishing territory and finding uh, mates, uh, but also we have birds that hang around uh, year-round here. Uh, so we'll just kind of point those out. Uh, we'll do a lot of birding by ear. Uh, birds are oftentimes hard to find this time of year. Uh, and we'll talk a bit about mnemonics, which are ways to remember bird songs, uh, phrases, and rhythms. All right, let's go for a walk. So here you see we have one of the old gates. Uh, Camp Nikon was purchased roughly 50 years ago from the Girl Scouts. Um, and in that 50 years, the property was wide open and a lot of people were driving around in there, uh, off-road vehicles, Jeeps, trucks, causing a lot of erosion. You'll see a little bit as we go through there where there's a lot of rutting and puddling. Um, and we have vernal pools that were filling up with sediment. When I started working here, one of my first goals was to curb that. Uh, we were able to hire a welder to extend this gate right here so that it would lock again and install two more gates on two of the main access roads. And the reason for gating as to opposed to blocking it off is to make sure the fire department can get in. Uh, this is an area where you know fire risk is, is concerning. Um, so we were able to get this area gated off now. We're working hard to block off any side entrances and just keep people from you know, using the property for the wrong reasons. So here we have one of the sites that's been heavily impacted by off-road vehicle use. Uh, you can see there's a fire pit down the bottom of the hill and there's an area where people were driving probably Jeeps, trucks and ATVs all the way up the sides of the hill and coming down the middle or vice versa. And you can see there's about four or five feet of erosion on that cut and all the sand has come down the hill right here. And what's happening is sediment from there and contaminants from the fire pit area are now running over to here, which is Rocky Pond. Rocky Pond is what they call an Atlantic Coastal Plain Pond. Uh, and that's a globally rare habitat type. It's not really found many other places on Earth. And you have rare plants and animals that use that habitat type that are now going to be affected by sediment and contaminants filling this pond. And we have several other vernal pools in here that are being filled up with sediment by off-road vehicle use from them going up and down the hills. Yeah, so uh, a couple of the bird species that we'll talk about today are pine warbler as well as the oven bird. These are two different species of wood warblers and they really rely on these pine forests. So without these pine forests, these birds traveling uh, back up to Massachusetts from Central and South America wouldn't have a place to nest. They wouldn't uh, have a place to set up territory. Uh, so their numbers in Kingston would go down uh, and the birds are already having a tough enough time uh, across the country. Matt and I are out here protecting these areas and making sure that they uh, continue to have these opportunities in Kingston. Mm -hmm. 
So while we were walking here, um, we saw a bright orange and black uh, bird fly over. Uh, I knew that as the Baltimore Oriole. The Baltimore Oriole gives out a really sing-songy, uh, whistly, chattery song. And uh, when we looked up, we actually saw a female uh, go into the tops of the trees uh, with a little bit of string in her uh, beak, probably some bark or something like that, uh, and building a nest. So we had the great opportunity to see a female Baltimore Oriole making a nest around here. Uh, the male was not far behind. Some other birds uh, that we've been hearing while we're walking, chipping sparrows. Uh, the eastern towhee. And yeah, the eastern towhee is a really great species for this part of Kingston. Uh, they're ground feeders, so they're oftentimes uh, scraping around the understory of these coastal plain ecosystems. So that's an oven bird. Um, people call it the excited student bird. It says, teacher, 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 teacher. That parabolic trill, so it starts low, gains higher, and then comes back lower again. That's a pine warbler. One of our first migrants to show up in Massachusetts. Uh, they'll set up shop here all summer. We have a tufted titmouse saying, Peter, Peter, Peter. And that's a, that's a really common backyard bird uh, that you can find at a lot of bird feeders uh, and find them year round as well. So we're here at one of the vernal pools at Camp Nikon, one that we actually surveyed recently that passes all the qualifications to be a certified vernal pool because we were able to find breeding evidence of spotted salamander and wood frog in here. And what vernal pools are, they are and find basins that fill up with water that typically dry out during some point in most years or at least occasionally, um, enough that you don't have fish present or larger predatory amphibians. Um, so they're really important features for them to be able to breed, in turn, feed the whole food chain essentially, what they call the trophic cycle. Uh, the, you know, young salamanders and frogs feed all sorts of other species up, up the chain. So. Um, maintaining healthy vernal pools is important for all your local ecology. One of the bird species that uses vernal pools uh, for feeding, uh, we have two raptor species that use it, um, red-shouldered hawks, as well as barred owls. Owls are everyone's favorite. The barred owl has a really fun mnemonic. Uh, it says, who cooks for you, who cooks for you all? So those birds will hang around uh, vernal pools and try to catch uh, frogs and snakes as they're coming in and out of the pools. So Matt was talking about those trophic levels. We have the insects that get eaten by the amphibians that then get eaten by the birds. So if you're interested in learning more about birds, uh, one of the great resources that I recommend to people is the Merlin Bird ID app. Uh, you can download it on any smartphone. It is through the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. Um, and they provide different uh, bird packs for different regions um, of the United States and of the world. And you can find there uh, photos of birds, audio of birds, and it actually has a feature where it will help you walk through the identification process. So it'll ask you um, what is the date, where are you seeing or hearing this bird, uh, what colors were it, how is it behaving, and it will actually create um, a list of birds that you might be seeing or hearing. So another way to learn more about birds in Kingston is by joining uh, the birding programs that the conservation and recreation departments uh, put on. Uh, if you want to learn more about birds directly through me, you can find my email on the uh, Kingston Conservation website, and I'm more than happy to field any questions about birds, uh, what's going on in the bird world, in the area, uh, audio clips, photos, it makes my day whenever anyone sends me one of those. Owning a home is still part of the American dream, but can seem unachievable in today's financial climate. For first-time home buyers, it can feel especially challenging, but there are some advantages. The Plymouth Redevelopment Authority, supported by Harbor One Mortgage, is offering a virtual first-time homebuyer class on July 26th and 27th from 5 to 9 p.m. This Zoom class will include presentations by a mortgage loan officer, an attorney, a real estate professional, home inspector, and an insurance agent, 
who will also all take your questions. They'll walk you through the home buying process, giving you the tools and confidence to pursue your goal of home ownership. Complete the program and receive a certificate, qualifying you to apply for loan programs such as Mass Housing's First Time Home Buyer Loan Program, MHP's The One Mortgage, and Down Payment Assistance Programs. You must participate on both evenings to receive your certificate. Learn more and register via the Plymouth Redevelopment website. Questions about this equal housing opportunity can be emailed to redevelopment at plymouth-ma.gov. Visitors are flocking to America's hometown this summer and See Plymouth is sponsoring an exciting initiative to make getting around more accessible, convenient, and free. Three multi-passenger electric cars will enable you to park your car once and ride free throughout the historic district, downtown, and waterfront areas. Available through Labor Day, downloading the Ride Circuit app is all you need to access this free service seven days a week from 11 a.m. through 9 p.m. More fun for you, less congestion downtown, and good for the environment. Visit the C Plymouth website to learn more. Packed with good for you vitamins, minerals, fat, and protein, insects can deliver quality nutrition to human beings if you can get over the fact that, well, they're bugs. Kids age 9 through 12 are invited to join the Plymouth Public Library and entomologist Blake Denius as he talks about insects you can eat and why they're good for you. Blake will even bring along some edible six-legged creatures for you to try, if you dare. You will not be required to eat anything if you attend. This event is on July 13th from 3 to 4 p.m. in the Phalo Meeting Room. Visit the library's website to register. We all know that pirate-themed magic is awesome. And on July 11th, the Kingston Public Library is hosting a special pirate-themed magic show for all ages. Head to the library tent at 3.30 p.m. with your family and a blanket to sit on to enjoy Awesome Rob's Pirate Magic Show. If it rains, the magic will take place in the children's room. Space is limited, so registration is required. Visit the library's website. Whether you're 5 or 85, learning new things gives you a boost in self-esteem, a sense of competency, and hope for the future. Lifelong learning is a powerful tool to keep brain cells functioning at optimum levels, and some seniors in our area are embracing the opportunity to gain knowledge and stay vibrant. We went on the local scene to get a glimpse at Senior College, a collaboration of Bridgewater State University and the Plymouth Center for Active Living. When I started at the center, my number one goal and dream was to bring lifelong learning, senior college, to Plymouth. That was huge for us. Um, I contacted Bridgewater State University. They had it on their agenda as well. We had a meeting, meeting of the minds. We were all excited. This was pre-COVID. We were ready. We pulled programs together. And then COVID hit, so it was done. We did bring it virtually through Zoom, but it didn't have the same kind of impact that we wanted. We're so excited to partner with Bridgewater State University. Senior College is finally here in person. Um, I'm originally from Plymouth, so I grew up here. I owned a home here, um, moved a, you know, a, few years back, a few years back to Sandwich. Um, so Plymouth is just an important part of my personal life. And beyond that, we understood that we had this beautiful Center for Active Living here in the community. And we, um, I knew that it was a vibrant, vibrant place. Um, I've been to the center many times for various activities through my role at the university. And so I just reached out to the staff here, sort of cold called and had an uh, open conversation with them. We came, we met, and just talked about what we were doing when we were planning senior college. This was way back in the fall of 2019. And so there was a lot of synergy between their thoughts around lifelong learning and what we were building at the university. And so we decided as a team to um, you know, offer classes here in person. From COVID being uh, kind of isolated for the last couple of years, has made it more difficult for me and probably a lot of other people to, you know, just communicate face to face because, you know, people haven't been together as much as they were before and, you know, you get out of practice, I guess. You wouldn't think you would, right, at a certain age, but you do. So, 
feels good to just get together with a, another group of people my age and do something like that and have fun. Forget about it? My dear Aunt Abby, can't I make you realize that something has to be done? You can't just leave him there. Oh, Teddy's down in the cellar now, digging the lock. You mean you're gonna bury Mr. Hoskins in the cellar? Oh, yes, dear. That's what we did with the others. No, you can't bury Mr. Others? It's funny what they come, the expectations they come in with. Some of them have just always wanted to try acting, but some of them come for social reasons. I've had several say, I just retired and I, I knew if I didn't do something, I wouldn't leave the house. So it's important for them to get out and socialize. They get to learn all these people's, we do name games every class. They really get to know each other and the personalities come out. We play games, which how many seniors are playing games? It's so much fun, it's social. And I've had, um, I had one particular woman join because she was having a relationship issue and she wasn't feeling seen or heard. And I, I always ask what their expectation is because I wanna make sure I address it if I can. And with status exercises, um, teaching people how to take on higher status and how it feels to have lower status. And I gave her a scene that gave her high status and one of the um, other participants said she found her voice. And by the end of the class, she looked different and she was carrying herself differently. And you just learn so much about how to act. I mean, we're acting all the time. So far, I mean, I love it because I retired about a year ago and I'm not ready to just sit still as a senior. So um, it's great because I've been doing Zoom classes before the pandemic. What's nice about this is I live in Bridgewater and I'm capable because we have the authority once we become students, I have a student pass, I can use their pool and their fitness center too. Classes are great because a lot of times you'll sign up at the beginning, like in July I think, our sign up is registration and come September my whole schedule's changed. So I might not be able to make a class. What's good about that is they record them. So I watch the class at my leisure then because it just didn't work out for me for that one class. The variety is wonderful. I've gone from the Old West to musicals to deja vu to anything that I just, it's, it's a lot of fun. It's really good. You can only read so many books during the day, right? And uh, it just appealed to me to, to uh, find another kind of community that deals with ideas. Uh, currently, I'm doing the acting class and uh, politics and film. The, the last uh, uh, course I took was history as I write it. So I'm, I'm particularly interested in uh, courses that will be either thoughtful or challenging. So over the years, Bridgewater offers a number of um, non-credit educational experiences, you know, theater, uh, lectures, author talks, all sorts of things like that. So a lot of people that are in the senior age range would come to those events and they would always be sort of knocking on the door of our president, Fred Clark, and saying like, we need a lifelong learning program. You know, there's similar programs at UMass Boston and um, there's a program on Cape Cod. They're all over the world. So they kept bugging him basically to say that they'd like to have a similar program at the university. And then ultimately back in 2018, it sort of came down the chain of command and landed in my desk. And basically my supervisor said, we're going to do this. And I said, great. And I had had some personal experience. I had served on a council on aging myself in a town that I used to live in. And so we just went for it. You know, we talk about mind, body, spirit, and just the intellect and just engaging the mind. That's exactly what we're doing. I mean, think about the caliber of instructors. You have true college level ideas, thoughts, trainings, education, and they're fun too. So you are really stimulating a, a senior's mind, um, really getting them to think about engaging, 
not only their own intellect, but with others. Social isolation, so huge, right? We wanna make sure that people are, are talking and learning and growing. One of my subjects on the bucket list is that I want to be able to hike every single national park. And that was a very good class for me because he told you about things that might not be good if you're not healthy enough, don't try these stairs that you're gonna see at such and such national park. And this is the main point for that national park, which was really good. So yes, I have. I, I, I totally love this. This is a much better time to go to school than when you're young. Because a lot of people, I was one of them, went to college because that was the life plan I was given. High school, college. I went, I did what I had to, but I didn't have the passion or the interest, and I didn't do the work that I did for this. In grad school, I was working full time, and I was up till two, three in the morning writing papers. And I graduated with a 393, working full time because I loved it. That's the difference. If you're curious about something, start, just go to the library and explore that one area and join a group that has to do with that thing that excites you. And maybe that's not it and something else will spark your curiosity. But if you follow that curiosity, it will energize you. And then you'll be living a fuller life. So go for it. You know, seniors tell me all the time, never stop growing never stop learning. There's not a finish line here in our own growth and what we, what we aspire to be, what our goals are, what our journey is. That's the, that's the thing. This is a journey. Learn about yourself, learn about other people, and leave here knowing that you've just changed the course of your journey. Adventure in the big outdoors with award-winning storyteller Diane Edgecombe and the Duxbury Free Library for Trail Mix on July 7th from 2 to 3 p.m. Families with kids aged four and up will discover a new dinosaur on a fossil dig in Montana and take on some feisty bugs in an afternoon of stories, song, and fun. Register via the library's website. The Robber Bridegroom is a southern Robin Hood fairy tale musical for adults, adapted from the 1942 novella by Eudora Welty. And it's playing here in Plymouth at the nonprofit Spire Center for Performing Arts from July 7th through the 24th. This backwoods bluegrass tall tale will be presented by Americana Theatre Company, also a nonprofit, and the South Shore's premier professional theatre company. Visit americanatheater.org for more details. Derek Martin founded Americana Theatre Company in 2011, which has grown to include both professional productions and the Studio Americana Educational Division. Julie Thompson spoke with Derek about what's new and next for this nonprofit. I'm so pleased to have Derek Martin here today, who is the founder of the Americana Theatre Company. Welcome. Well, thank you very much. Glad to be here. Glad to have you. Mm -hmm. So, what is the Americana Theatre Company and how did you get to be where you are right now today? Oh boy, uh, so the Americana Theatre Company is a professional theatre company. Uh, we operate out of downtown Plymouth in a couple of different venues. And uh, it was actually a dream that started in 2004, looking at downtown Plymouth and said, you know, we would love there to be professional, high quality, high caliber, uh, theater going on down here and at the time there really wasn't a whole lot mm -hmm. so uh, 2011 we launched and uh, I was the original founder of the company mm -hmm. and uh, along with uh, Jesse Sullivan some members of my family friends put together our first show and launched in 2011 what was your first show it was Noel Coward's private lives aha uh -huh. So we started with a pretty heavy hitter right uh, that's after a that. That's tough one. I was going to say, that <laughs> is not an easy show to do. It is. Now, we started with a lot of uh, uh, MFA graduates oh, uh, right. that started for Master of Fine Arts in acting. Yep. So it was, uh, you know, high caliber actors, and we brought them together and 
said, let's do something really fun, but something that's challenging. Yes. See how the audiences like it. Okay, so that was in, in 2011. Now in yes. 2015, you brought on David and Aaron Friday. Yes. Talk about them and what their part is. Sure. Uh, so David's been our managing director for years. Uh, he came in to help out, uh, help deal with the books, help do uh, that side of it. He's also a brilliant technician. So mm -hmm. he was he helped with building sets. He come great ideas and uh, very creative, uh, really fun person. And then uh, Erin came in as the educational director, and she's really done a marvelous job creating these environments and experiences for young aspiring artists. So let's talk about that. Sure. So I know a lot of kids like to go to theater camp, or, yes. and even older kids mm -hmm. and older people like to take classes in theater or, or choreography or mm -hmm. dance or, or makeup or whatever it is. So talk about what, what is the educational component tied to the Americana Theater? So it's kind of, we, we hit on a multiple, multiple different angles. Okay. So well, I would say one thing they're doing coming up now is summer camp. So right when the show opens, the week after we open, summer camp start, and they're doing, you know, Jungle Book and Newsies Junior oh, nice. uh, back to back. And so summer camps are a big part of it, giving students the opportunity to learn a show really quick, work with uh, professionals. Um, then we have like one-off classes. There's dance classes, acting classes. There was a like a ballroom class for adults that was taught, and, and, and that did really well. Um, and a multitude of other music courses, things like that. Uh, and then there's different workshops during the year as well. Okay. So it's a very busy studio. So Year-round. Year-round, very busy. Our studio is actually, I would say, one of the most busy parts of uh, Americana. Okay. Now you don't have a um, an actual permanent home you as, as far as where you perform yes. and where you practice so how do you how do you work that out so we've been working with uh, three spaces over the year uh, we started in Plymouth Center for the Arts down on North Street yep. in Plymouth um, and they've been nothing but amazing to us throughout the years mm -hmm. and, and so much so that we've continued that relationship every Christmas every holiday production we do is at Plymouth Center for the Arts Wonderful. Uh, then one of our earlier first uh, places we worked was at Kendall Hall mm -hmm. in the first parish of Plymouth. Uh, and we've done a few shows there that's been appropriate for the, you know, being next to Burial Hill, yeah, something sure. kind of fun, little murder mysteries. We did the 39 Steps uh, comedy murder mystery. Yeah. Uh, we did a one man version of The Legend of Sleepy Hollow down there, uh, which was a blast. Interesting. Oh, it's yeah. so fun. And it was written by um, company members. So oh, it was a great terrific. original piece. And then uh, we started doing bigger productions as our, as our clientele grew, mm -hmm. we moved into the Spire Center uh, downtown Plymouth, and they've been our summer home for everything ever since. Yeah, so it's that's a beautiful right. venue. Love it, yeah. Yeah, gorgeous. So let's talk about the company itself. So sure. when people think about going to see a, uh, a theater production, mm -hmm. it's either, you know, people that uh, just, they have full-time jobs and they just do it because they have a hobby that they do at night. <laughs> um, a lot of the community theaters are like that. Yeah. How How is your company in that for anyone who doesn't know the lingo, yeah. that's everyone who's actually involved in the production. It's called the company. Yes. How, how, how do you draw, where do you draw them from? The company comes from all over. Um, we draw a lot from New York. We Our company's uh, entirely either professionals or apprentices who are often college age students um, that we bring in. Yep. Everybody gets paid. Mm -hmm. um, we bring in high, really, really high quality artists out of New York. We've had Virginia Beach, we've had, um, you know, Pennsylvania, California, and Boston area. We okay. pull from the whole region, both local and uh, outside, to create these shows. Mm -hmm. And same with our uh, creative team. So the directors, the yep. choreographers, the designers, all of them come from out of town. Or are, if there's somebody local who's appropriate for it and is a professional, we bring them Use on them. Now, Absolutely. do you have the same company that works on every production, or is it kind of a mix and match? Uh, it's a mix and match. Uh, oftentimes, members of the company will work on every production. So okay. we always have company members in every production. The audiences love it. Yeah. They see familiar faces. Yep. The faces are locals. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of our companies locals. But we do have company members uh, who are from outside of the area. We have some from New Jersey, New York, and who come in. And if there's an appropriate show for them, uh, then we bring them on in. They're kind of our, we, we want to go to them first. If there's something that's for, that can work for a company member, we want to try to bring the company members sure. in. Sure, absolutely. absolutely. Now, it's a problem having kids in some shows, right, mm -hmm. because of the hours. 
So yeah. is it mostly adults that are in most of your productions? Most of our productions. Unless they are geared towards the Unless kids it's geared, group. yeah. Okay. So for instance, when we, we've done It's a Wonderful Life, the live radio play, yep. many Christmases, that's one of our staples we do. Yep. And uh, we always bring, you know, George Bailey's, the children, yep. are usually from Studio Americana. We pull yep. from the studio and bring them up. Um, we're very careful though, there's there's laws about that. Sure, so we, absolutely. you know, when yep. 10 o'clock hits, the kids gotta, gotta be, be up, you know, yeah. we gotta get them home and get right. them to bed as fa fast as we can. Now, um, you're currently, um, you're doing a production called The Robber Bridegroom. Yes. So let's talk a tiny bit about that mm -hmm. and how you, how long you prep for it and how long it actually is, is lit, sure. how long it's, it's going. Okay, the, um, so it's a really fun show. Yeah, I'll just talk quickly, yep. I'll give a little plug to The sure, Robber Bridegroom. Of it's uh, it's a ton. It, it, it's a southern bluegrass fairy tale written by Eudora Welty, who's from Mississippi originally, and okay. it's an interpretation of a Grimm's fairy tale. Okay. Um, it, it's it's got a little bit of just just as a rating kind of thing. It's probably more PG. It's got a little yeah. you know a little bit of language, a little, little bit a yeah. little edge okay. to it. Uh. Um, but it's nothing but fun. The cast members, the, the there's a full bluegrass orchestra, Great. but it's they're all members of the cast. Okay. So the cast is also playing instruments. So they're all musicians and they're, Yeah, they're all wow. musicians. Wow. And it's really, real. this cast is particularly amazing. Yeah. Um, and it's created like storytellers theater. They create the worlds right there and tell the story uh, of the Robber Rye Room. It's kind of like a Robin Hood-esque yep. fairy tale okay. going on. So, uh, and it's nothing but fun. It's dancing and singing and, you know, it's a Pooping yeehaw and good time. And people Pooping, and feeling good. A yeah. hundred yeah. percent. It's yeah. it's just a blast. It's about the dual nature of man. So if you're looking, our uh, slogan is stories that matter, uh, stories that entertain us, stories that matter. Right. And so it's kind of about the dual nature of man uh -huh. and mankind. Um, so that's kind of the matter part, but but it's, it's through fun. comedy. Yeah. It's just okay. a, a total uh, comedy. <laughs> How long did that take to, from auditions to the sure. night, you, opening night? So I would say auditions are usually in March yep. when we get everybody in, February, March. Uh, and then we started rehearsing about a week ago. The rehearsal's usually about two to three weeks. Wow. And then we put it up on its feet and it runs for about three weeks in the summer. So it'll open on July 7th and it's okay. Thursday through Sunday, Sunday. seven o'clock at night yep. at, at the Spire Center. Oh, that's fabulous. Yeah. So you you have to truly have professionals if it only takes you three weeks to put the show together. That's a major part of it. Yeah, the, obviously. The speed at which it's going, yeah. we have to get, and it is it is a fast process. Sure. It's especially when you're doing a musical and you're adding dance and oh, song. Yeah. And, and then if everybody's playing music to, you know, there's about 30 songs in the show. Wow. So for everyone to be able to uh, oh, yeah. learn all the stuff and yeah. memorize it, it just takes some time. Good for you. Oh yeah, it's a yeah. blast. So, and how many productions have you done all together, all told, do you have the number? Wow, uh, a lot, but when you add in the kids shows who often, uh, the studio shows, they're often, you know, they do, gosh, six a year, six to eight a oh, year. Wow. Uh, uh, Americana usually does two to four a, a year, year as, yeah. as the yeah. professional company. Yeah. So gosh, it's been about, I, I say it's been about 12 minus one years we've wow. been around because of, uh, because of COVID, we lost yeah. one. So we're 12 minus one. Yeah, so over 50, <laughs> probably over 50 Over production. 50, easily. That's yeah. fabulous, yeah. yeah. And how do people get involved, get, um, uh, donate, because I know you're 501c3. Yeah, absolutely. How do people take classes? How do they go to auditions? So Tell I just say that. the best way to get involved, to get connected is through our website. Our website is kind of a catch-all. Yep. It has the tickets right there. It's uh, americanatheater.org. Okay, that's easy. And so, but it's, I got to remember to spell it T-H-E-A-T-R-E. It's so it's kind of the British way of spelling old it. It's the old-fashioned way. The old-fashioned way. Absolutely. So Americana Theater is one word, yeah, dot .org. Okay. And then everything's there. The studio classes, yeah. being able to sign up for Studio Americana, Connect In is there. The tickets are all there. What's coming on? Past productions and pictures. Great. You can go look through stuff. It's Everything all there. Donations, all right yeah. there. Absolutely. Perfect. It's Perfect. Catch all. Well, so uh, when's <laughs> opening night? Opening night is July 7th. Oh, great. It's right after the long weekend. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So you have great time on the 4th of July, yeah. and we'll keep that yeah. great time going through the rest of the summer. Do you generally sell out? 
Uh, we actually do extremely well. Yeah, the musicals yeah. especially do yeah. do much better. So yeah, I would say get tickets. They're going fast. Yep. Uh, and we've, uh, you know, McGrath PR, Michelle McGrath is yeah. helping us out, and Super. she's been doing a great job. People Good. are calling us all the time. Good. Wonderful. Yeah. Well, thank you for joining us, oh and my best gosh. of luck. Thank you so much. Okay. Appreciate it. Have you been researching your ancestry and have accumulated some cool stories you'd like to share? Join other family history buffs at the Pembroke Public Library on July 26th from 6.30 to 7.30 p.m. All are welcome to attend this monthly genealogy night from experienced researchers to beginners who would like to learn more about the process. Library laptops will be available to explore Ancestry Library Edition. Come to find or share tips and stories. Leave with new friends. Register via the Pembroke Public Library. It's Community Helper Storytime at the Duxbury Free Library this month featuring a story from a police officer from the Duxbury Police Department. Visit the Merry Room on July 14th from 2 to 2.45 p.m. with your little one aged 3 and up. No registration is required. Next up is Mark McKinley with an all-new Snapshot. Welcome to Snapshot where we take a local look at the government stories that you may have missed. Last week, Governor Baker signed the Votes Act into law, making so that mail-in ballots and early voting are now allowed in the state. Along with increasing ballot access for voters with disabilities and overseas service members, it also makes sure that those incarcerated can request a mail-in ballot and allows for steps to be taken to update the state's election administration process. The law does not provide for registering and voting on Election Day. Vote-by-mail applications will be mailed in July and September for the upcoming primary and state elections in September and November. You can also download them online and follow the instructions to submit the form. Voters who wish to vote in person can still do so on Election Day or through in-person early voting. In June, the Massachusetts House of Representatives passed a bipartisan mental health bill that would address behavioral care in the state. Included in the bill is an amendment filed by Representatives Josh Cutler and Kathy Lenatra that would allow for more qualified licensed clinicians to be added to the workforce in a timelier manner. The amendment would add two seats to the Allied Board of Mental Health and adjust the makeup of the board so that it better reflects the actual number of active licensed clinicians, which is currently two-thirds of all license holders in the state. It also has the Department of Public Health review the idea of establishing a separate licensure board for licensed clinicians and report back to the legislature next year. The legislation heads to the Senate now for review. As part of the Town of Kingston's water withdrawal permit, the Board of Water Commissioners has issued the following water restriction to be effective immediately. Even-numbered houses may water on even-numbered days before 9 a.m. and after 5 p.m. Odd-numbered homes may water on odd-numbered days before 9 a.m. and after 5 p.m. Please help us protect our water supply by obeying this water restriction. Last week, the town of Plymouth was presented a check for $2.25 million through the Plymouth County ARPA program. Established to facilitate recovery from the pandemic and its economic impacts, one of the uses of ARPA funds will be to repair wastewater treatment facilities and wastewater pipes. Certainly, uh, something like wastewater is not the most exciting, right? But it's an extremely important uh, part of our lives, of course. So uh, the foresight of the Town of Plymouth, the Airport Committee, uh, the leadership at the select board level to uh, pursue these funds to Plymouth County for this project uh, was a no-brainer for us from the commissioners to support. Specifically, these funds will be used to upgrade the airport's wastewater facilities to current standards, planning for future growth for the town and area. The existing plant was built in the year 2000 and it serves all the buildings on the airport. Um, due to changes in the DEP regulations, we're in need of upgrading the um, system so as to stay in compliance with our DEP permit. 
this particular grant will enable us to not only put in emergency power, since we currently don't have that, so in the case of a power outage, the treatment plant goes uh, dormant and that can cause permit violations. So this should address that particular issue and allow us to stay in compliance going into the future. It also will hopefully allow us to tie in some of the local businesses and houses that are located along South Meadow Road and would be part of the town's overall goal of connecting uh, all of the town ultimately with a sewer system rather than just Title V systems. So it would bring the, the current uh, treatment plant up to current code, which we certainly think is very important uh, from a safety standpoint and from an environmental standpoint. Crediting the work of town hall staff and the airport manager, Plymouth town manager Derek Brindisi spoke about the need for this project. Lynn Barrett, our finance director, uh, Jonathan Beter, our public works director, and Tom Maher, our airport manager, they're the ones that actually really did all the hard work, right? They're the ones that came together. They, they recognized this as a priority. Um, they recognized that this was a need. And most importantly, they recognized that if we are able to take advantage of these opera funds, it'll help mitigate rising taxes uh, to our residents. It'll help mitigate um, the, the wastewater uh, uh, sewer rates uh, to those ratepayers. So again, kudos to them for the work that they put into this, recognizing this and taking advantage uh, of the, uh, this funding opportunity. With design plans for the upgrade already completed, the project will be going out to bid in July with work to begin this fall and expected to be completed in the fall of 2023. You can watch the press conference in its entirety, along with the latest episode of This Week in Plymouth, where town manager Derek Brindisi talks about the project on PacTV's website at www.pactv.org slash Plymouth and on the Plymouth Government Channel, Comcast 15 and Verizon 47. The purpose of the Massachusetts Commission on the Status of Women is to promote equality and opportunities for all women and girls in the Bay State. Each year, state legislators work with the Commission to identify and recognize women from their districts who work and contributions enrich their communities. This year, nominees from our local delegation were celebrated at the ceremony on June 22nd. Nominated by Representative Matt Muratori, Peg Page of Plymouth was recognized for her work and dedication to the Plymouth Center for the Arts and helping the town to create a permanent home for arts and culture in the town's former library. Duxbury resident Megan Driscoll Greenstein was nominated by Representative Josh Cutler for using her business talents to help shape public policy and efforts for pay equality and wage transparency in the Commonwealth. State Senator Susan Moran nominated Sarah Cloud of Pembroke for her role as Director of Social Work at Beth Israel Deaconess Hospital Plymouth and the impact she has had by creating and implementing services that recognize the needs of those who are struggling in our communities. Janet Wade, a resident of Kingston, was nominated by Representative Kathy Lenatra for her work in improving the health of her community and keeping residents informed on health topics of interest to them through her PAC TV show, Healthy Kingston. Congratulations to all these women for their awards and for being role models for others in our communities. Thanks for watching this edition of Snapshot. I'm Mark McKinley, and we will see you next time. Thank you, Mark, and thank you for watching this episode. Local Matters will be on hiatus over the next few weeks, but we'll be back on August 5th with more of what's good and good to know in our area. From all of us at PAC TV, have a safe and happy 4th of July. We will see you in August.
Thank you for watching. We are grateful for your attention. If you like what you saw, please like and subscribe to The Local Scene here and share everywhere. Thank you, friends.